I just found myself um, sat outside, no purpose, no reason for it. Just sat on the balcony. It's pretty, it's a pretty balcony, pretty view. Um, and I just watched the people walking their dogs and I listened to the birds sing. And I was sat there and I was going, I feel like an old person, an old Spanish person. It's not just in Spain they do this. In Southern Europe, the weather's such that you can just sit outside and you can just watch people go past. It's not all bad. Some of it's quite pleasant. So I'm sat there on the balcony and, you know, with an overwhelming urge to just uh, shout at people. Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> you all right? <laughs> don't, I don't do it. I don't dare. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> but a few people do it to me though when I'm walking around here. Like people are just saying to me, hiya. I'm like, hello. Did you forget that we're in England? We don't greet each other in this way. So usually it's only old people. Like old people are like, morning. I can never bring myself to say morning back. I always go, hi, which is weird. It sounds, I don't know if that sounds weird to you, but it is a weird. Morning, hi, <laughs> ah yeah, is my reply. But now people are just randomly just saying hello. Like, all right. I don't know what day it is. I genuinely, authentically do not know what day of the week it is. I'm using a smartphone to record this. I could just look. I kind of don't care. I'm just letting it happen. Just let it happen, man. It's not that bad. It's not that bad at all. I've started writing again. Moment, I'm doing about 2,500 words a day. Obviously, that's not what's going to be in the final thing, but I'm just getting it out and I'll refine it later. And um, I started to think about love while I was sat outside listening to a bird that sounds like R2D2. Took some video footage of it, stuck it on my Instagram. I'm going to ask people what they think it is. Maybe it's a magpie. I don't know. It's nice though, it's got a nice sound. And um, so yeah, I'm thinking about love. And uh, a lot of what this channel has been dedicated to really has been in its essence is all about love and all about disappointment in love and, and experiencing pain. And sometimes when, when I'm teaching a thing or talking about like teaching, maybe just like talking about it, analyzing it, extrapolating, expanding it outward, giving people a chance to think for themselves about it. Or if you look at this piece, look at it this way. Synthesis. And, um, sometimes it helps me. And I realize one of the mistakes that I've made in the past is I've allowed myself to be corralled, pushed into like an animal down there an artificially created shoot um, by a wrangler, by a handler, into a certain modality during relationships. And it is that of being the product, being the product to be consumed in a relationship, which implies there's a consumer, which implies that there is a client, a consumer. And I am to be pleasurable to be a good product I must please I please as in the phrase placebo or nocebo I will not please so I've allowed myself to be corralled into being a placebo that which gives pleasure that which is sweet that which is like a delicious cupcake now I'm not I when I was thinking about this it was like I don't really care about the fact that whether like I'm gonna be sweet or I'm gonna be salty or I'm gonna be pleasurable, or I'm gonna be painful. It's not that that bothers me. It's that I knew in both of, I don't know, I've had multiple relationships and um, some of them just didn't work out because they just didn't work out, it was nothing. Uh, one of them was bad um, and she had a lot of mental health problems and was using a lot of drugs and looking back, I think I missed that she had, she had an eating disorder and I never, I never cottoned onto it properly. And, but she wasn't, and she did, she did cheat on me. I mean, it was a bad relationship. It was highly dramatic, but not what I would call narcissistically abusive. 
So you can have somebody who's a drug addict with multiple problems who cheats on you and they're still nowhere near as bad as when it becomes like full scale narcissistic abuse because it really um, damages you when you're with somebody who's, who's, who's got it bad and that's part of their protocol is to damage you, is to, is to hurt you. Sometimes, it's not always like that, but sometimes it is. And um, in the two relationships where I was with somebody who was bad, I was consciously aware that I would be corralled into the role of product and I still couldn't escape from that. I was like, the, this girl is making you feel like she's your judge and you're to be rated by her. There's nothing in this that says, I was aware enough to know it was being done to me. I was like, there's nothing in this that says that she has the right to judge you and you don't to judge her. Like that's insane. But I still couldn't crack it. I couldn't crack it. So I found myself to my horror unconsciously and against my volition trying to get a good review trying to get a good review and I thought bloody hell where the hell does that come from why did I never put myself in the position of being the consumer rather than the consumed why didn't I flip the script and be like well you know, you're judging me and making me feel like I'm deficient as a boyfriend, like I'm delivering a bad service, like I'm not worthwhile. Who says that you're so fucking wonderful? Who says that, you know, you're so fucking perfect? You're not. You're not. You also are a human being and you're also fallible. And I started to broaden that out because I've got the time to do that. <laughs> I can't just work all day. I can't record videos all day. I can't be writing all day. I go to the shop, I train, but I'm training at home like a prisoner. I got a pull-up bar today, uh, which is good. It's one of these non-screw ones. It just hangs on the frame. It's really, really good. Um, I think you have to be under something like 120 kilos or something like that, it says. I wouldn't try and use it. If you're over 95 kilos, I don't think I would be using it. Um, but I can't just do that all the time, so I have the time to think. So I expanded this out. And I was like, is there a consumer mindset? Is there a, consu is there a sort of a consumer consumed mindset? And I was like, yes, of course. This is what Slavoj Zizek would say, ironically, is ideology at its purest. We're reducing ourselves to commodities and we reduce each other to consumable commodities. And this, Ich, how ideology functions today, it's invisible. You don't know it. And even when you do know it, that doesn't mean you can resist it. So I was like, well, where did that come from? Is it um, parenting? Is it bad judgmental parenting? I'm like, yeah, probably, but is it not institutional? When you're a little kid and you put, let's say, we are the philosopher kings of a brand new nation, right? And there's six of us sat around a circle, a circular table. Circular, circular. <laughs> Doing nothing is affecting my brain. <laughs> so, I'm not drunk, I swear to God. I've just not done that much today. Just trained, potted around, read a little bit of a book. I tried to read Love in the Time of Cholera. Let me say this. I fucking hate that book and more, I have more, more to say. This is part of what I was gonna, what I'm gonna get into. I hate Gabriel uh, Garcia Marquez. I, I hate him. I hate his writing. It's boring. It's obsessed with rot and age and dullness. He's not a bad writer. In fact, he's a very, very, very technically good writer, but I hate his writing. <laughs> it feels so good to say that out loud. I read um, 100 Days of Solitude, Cien Años de Solitud, and um, El Coronel No Tiene Quien Le Escriba. The Colonel doesn't have anyone to write to him. And I think one of those, I think El Coronel No Tiene Quien Le Escriba, I think I, wrote, I read it in Spanish. Uh, 100 Days of Solitude, I read, I read it in English and I had to read it, I had to finish it. God, it's boring. Love in the Time of Cholera, boring. It's just boring, 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 it's boring. It's a boring book. You have to want to dwell in a swamp with rotten 
unlikable characters to to enjoy that book. It's it's brilliantly written, and I do like hanging out with unlikable characters. It's not that because I, one of my favorite books of all time is Blood Blood Meridian, and there's no good character in that book. They're all awful, dreadful, malicious, vindictive, raping psychopaths doing terrible things. But it's so beautifully written. Such a beautiful book, Blood Meridian. Can't recommend that enough. Um, but Love in the Time of Cholera, I read the first 30 pages and then I skipped to the last 15 pages and I was like, that's it. I'm not, I'm not spending any more time on this. So, if we were the warrior kings, the philosopher kings and, uh, and queens, and we were sat around this table and we said, well, we got, we're going to educate kids. What are we going to do? Well, we want them to grow up strong. We want them to grow up healthy. Okay. All right. And we want them to be good citizens, we want them to be kind, we, but we want them to be capable, right? Is that the intent of the education? We want to teach them to develop a moral philosophy. We want to teach them to be good, strong, kind, uh, take no shit, tough, uh, fierce, moral human beings, right? Would we have them graded? on their performance. Yes, perhaps at a certain age. What would that grading look like? It would depend on the skill set. It would depend on what you'd have them learn. You know, would you have them learn carpentry? Would you have them learn mathematics? Would that, and then how would you test them? Because I started to think about how young I was tested and how I was graded. And I was getting grades and being tested at a very young age. And one of the things that that does is it puts you on the back foot. Because the younger you have that done to you, the more of an impact it has on you. It's like I'm being graded on my performance. I'm the product, the school is the consumer and they're leaving me an Amazon review. This was before Amazon reviews and eBay reviews and whatever reviews were a thing. But I was being reviewed. I was being tested and I was never asked to review the school. Never asked to review the teachers, not once. I mean, that absolutely, if you had suggested that, it would have been met with um, uh, possibly physical violence. I, I, I never was in an education system where there was much physical violence at all, um, but certainly institutional violence. Certainly you would have been punished. Certainly you would have been treated with contempt and derision and aggression had you said, had you dared to suggest, can I grade you? Can I grade you as a Spanish teacher? Because I had two Spanish teachers. One of them was brilliant and the other one was retiring that year and he wasn't worth a fart. He didn't give a shit. He was an arrogant, pompous, silly old twat who couldn't be arsed doing his job. He was a lazy, inept, useless twat of a man. It feels really good to reverse this judgment thing, by the way. I want to be able to have the ability to say, I know that Gabriel Garcia Marquez is a great writer and I know that he's a national hero of Colombia and you know one of the great writers in the Spanish world, the Spanish speaking world. I know that and I don't deny that he's a great writer, but I fucking hate his writing. <laughs> and also, Mr. Walton was a good Spanish teacher, but the other one, we called him God. His nickname in school was God because he was so fucking pompous and so arrogant and so old. <laughs> He's an ex-Cambridge dude, uh, this guy. And fucking hell, he really believed that the sun came from out of his bottom hole. <laughs> God, Mr. Walton, he was a good teacher. He was thorough and he cared. And if you, know, you couldn't conjugate your verbs, he'd take time out of his own day to sit with you and, and make sure you knew what you were doing. But God was useless. God was fucking useless. Inept, lazy, just didn't want to know. Just waiting for his retirement. I was, I will give her a review of your fucking dog in a minute. Yapping little wretch. <laughs> I don't know what it is about people with their dogs. Like if you buy a dog, it behooves you to learn how to, how, like go online, and invest, given that you're going to have to walk your dog for at least an hour a day every day. And if you don't do that, you're just a terrible human being. You're just a bad person. And you should feel bad for not doing it. 
But it, given that you're going to do that, it probably merits learning how to deal with dogs for like three or four hours of your life. Maybe even hiring a dog trainer. This thing where, where people put their dogs... Anyway, I'm not going to get into that rant about people with their dogs and their leads and how fucking lazy and stupid people are. Um, so I never was given the chance to review the school. So it created a one-way system in my head and in my heart and in my being where I'm being reviewed. And it's impolite to review other people. But I do have feelings about other people. And then I started to expand it out. And I was like, well, what about the relationships you're in? What would have happened had you reversed the flow and sort of gone, hmm, I'm not actually enjoying the service you're providing as a girlfriend. Uh, there was on the packaging in the sales copy before I signed up for this, this was what I was promised. And this is what I'm being delivered. I'm sending you back. I wouldn't have dreamed of doing that with either of them because it was just outside of my mental conditioning. It's not what a man does. It's not gentlemanly conduct. It's not, you know, I'm there to please her, not the other way around. And I don't think this is a, maybe it is a man woman thing. Let me avoid that particular minefield. I think in the field of narcissistic abuse, the narcissist plays on that. The narcissistic psychopath plays on your desire to be pleasing, to be placebo, to be a placebo, and to offer you reviews, and to judge you from on high. Incredible arrogance. I look back on it now and I'm like, what a farcical fucking pantomime my last two relationships were. Why would an intelligent man, with options by the way, you know, go through all that and then stick with the abuse, know it was abuse and then stick with it for months and then ultimately for, well, I didn't do years, um, but certainly I did uh, a year and a half and then two and a half years and the first and then the second. Why would I bother? Why would I let myself be reviewed like that? Why would I let somebody say to me, this is where you're failing, this is what you're not doing? So that's useful. Don't do that. Don't let somebody review you. You also have the right to review the other person and go, well, this sucks. And then I started to say, does it apply to books and movies? Obviously. Movies, I would always do that with because I've never not felt the right to do that. I've always been like, well, I, I tell stories for a living. I have done for a very, very long time. I do various things for a living. I, I sell things for a living. I communicate for a living. I talk for a living, but I tell stories for a living. So when you're telling me a bad story, and I mean you're doing it badly, and it's nothing to do with your budget, it's nothing to do with your actors, it's nothing to do with the scope of what the studio will let you do. You suck at writing a story. I have no patience for that because there are books and books that come out every single year on how to write well. There's a really funny book, I can't remember its name now, but it's like what you should never do, the, the rule, the things you should never do when you're writing. And it's laugh out loud funny. It's, it's really, really good. And that, I read that back in 2009. So there's no way there isn't like a library full of books that tells you this is what to do, this is what not to do. So when I sit down and I watch a movie that had a budget that I know was like $200 million and the writing stinks, I'm ready to tear the seats out and throw it at the screen. I'm like, there's no excuse for this shit. There's no excuse for this shit because it's only writing. How, what are you spending your money on? What are you chucking your money on? Get a good writer, not 15 of them, America. Bigger is not always better. <laughs> More is not always better. We need a team. We need 15 people telling the same story at the same time. So we have 15 different voices. No, no, you don't. You can go back to the days where people, where Americans made good films, where you would have a writer who was also the director. Wow, one, one voice telling a whole story. You don't have that anymore. It's all done by committee, shit absolutely shit and when it's good when the writing is good i'm like oh my god thank you i found myself recently going back to uh, the sopranos and just watching clips of the sopranos and it's like a soothing balm to the creative pain my soul is in i'm like oh my god characters saying and doing things that feel authentic that are interesting that are it's engaging and i want to know more and i'm just like 
where did all this go? Where's the, where's it all going? Why do every time I turn on the TV, I'm looking at something. It's a film, it's a TV show. And I'm like, I am just watching really good looking people in a room saying words to each other. I fucking hate that. Models in rooms saying things. <laughs> boring, boring, or some millennial toe end trying to subvert my expectations. <laughs> Shit. I've always felt the right to do that though with films. To a degree with books, perhaps less so. Like books have to be venerated. And I started going, well, what, what about life experience? What about the world? Why don't you expand it out? Why don't you just play with it as a thought experiment? How do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? How do you feel about the view? The view here is amazing, by the way. It's so good. I'll, if you go on my Instagram, you'll, you'll see all the viewers. In fact, I've got drone footage that Pierre XO is mixing into the next video that I'm gonna release of this place here. It's called Hoy Lake Beach. Hoy Lake Beach is beautiful, absolutely beautiful place. How do I feel about it? I would say to myself, I'm like, I really love this. If you didn't care about the view and you were here, that's fine. You don't have to, you don't have to like the same things I do, but it would really bring the value of the place down. But I look at it and I like, I get a high off it. I can snort three or four lines of the view right before my morning coffee and it just brings me up. <laughs> it just brings me up for the day. So you can protect yourself and you can get out of situations that you don't want to be in when you start becoming aware that there's a consumer and product dynamic going on. You should never be in a consumer product dynamic, by the way. I think if, if you want me to say why I think modern relationships are so fucking hard to maintain, I think I've consumed two or three hours of Sam Backman talking, maybe two hours is probably more, no, it's two or three hours now in the last few days talking about relationships and the breakdown of sexual dynamics and everything else. I would say it's that. I would say it's, it's, it's ideology. It's late stage capitalism. Everything is reduced to a commodity. And it, it, the, the effect on large groups of humans of living in that environment and being soaked in that ideological space for their lives, not for hours at a time, but their whole lives is, they infantilize. They infantilize. And so you get to places in a relationship, oh God, what did he call it? He said an intimacy cloud. He said people now have intimacy clouds. Well, in the last uh, two relationships I was in, see, I'm a weird age because I've seen, the, I've seen the dating world change. I never got married. So I've seen women change. And people say to me, oh no, it's not like that. This is, you're putting the lenses on, it's not. It's, and I'm like, you can't bullshit me. I remember what it was like before. And now I see what it's like now. And it's a huge change. It's a huge change. So he's talking about intimacy clouds. And he says, now everybody has like an intimacy cloud. And he said, if you went back 15 years ago, and uh, a woman had seven or eight admirers following her around, that would get her designated as a histrionic or a borderline. If a guy kept seven or eight admiring women around and then had a girlfriend or a wife, he would probably be designated as a narcissist. Now it's considered normal. There was um, an article, it did get a bit of pushback when it came out. I wanna say it was in Vogue. It was written in a publication that was American that was, that was targeted to um, younger, young, younger women, um, up and coming younger women, right? Materialistic, success orientated, great. And it was talking about how every woman should develop a gaggle, like a gaggle of geese. I'm going back a ways now. I'm pretty sure this is pre 2008. Maybe it's around 2008 it came out. And it was basically not, it was not just saying, oh, this is the thing that happens. It was like, if you, like, it's like having the, the right shoes or the Louis Vuitton bag or whatever the latest bag is, I don't fucking know, or the, the, the thing that is the status. What kind of a modern woman doesn't have six or seven guys chasing around? Ooh, like, who's in your gaggle? Who's, like, who's? <laughs> and it was, a, it, was a, it was a thing. And everybody's doing that, which, which you go, well, so what's the big deal? And I go, well, do you get to have your cake and eat it? I don't think so. Because if you have, say we have 
10 men and 10 women, and they all have an intimacy cloud or a gaggle. And you put them in a Big Brother style scenario, a house together, and watch and see them pair bond off, start to have sex with each other and start to deal with the complexities of being in some kind of a relationship with somebody. Because we're talking about long-term relationships now. What you will find at a certain point along the timeline is one or both of them is going to come up against the barrier of the other person's intimacy cloud. And one or both of them is going to say to the other, you can't have that intimacy cloud. You can't have a gaggle. And they will be upset. In my last two relationships, um, like my last relationship, I ended it in 2010. This is not all that new. Like th this, this kind of stuff is, has been around for, a, I would say a good 20 years now. Um, but in both of those relationships, when I said to both of these girls, you can't be in regular contact with five, six, seven, eight guys who want to have sexual intercourse with you and be with me. And they were appalled and angry at that. And I'm there scratching my head going, I don't get this. Both of them are seven years younger than me. And you go, well, that's it's not a huge difference, but it's enough. It's enough of a generational split between Gen X and millennials that there was significant coordinate shifts where I was like, okay, <laughs> for a start, how would you deal? How would you deal <laughs> with me texting, Facebooking, whatevering through my magic mobile phone, seven, never mind seven, how about two? How would you feel? Like if you were a girl and you were with me or a proxy me and proxy me said to you, oh yeah, I was, I was just chatting to my mate so-and-so who's attractive and then you, you see them together or you read the messages and there's clearly sexual tension there. How would you feel about that? Because now you're supposed to be cool with it. You're supposed to be, you're supposed to say the, 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 the thing that's a la mode is to be cool, is to be indifferent because you have your own intimacy cloud. Your partner has an intimacy cloud. You don't be paranoid. You don't be checking their phone. You don't question who they're chatting to. You don't, and I'm just like, okay, here's my new superpower. I get to say when I think something sucks, I think that fucking sucks. I wouldn't tolerate it for a minute. <laughs> Are people, like people in the comments, I'm looking forward to it. Generally, the younger they are, the more appalled they'll be by that. But I would say, no, no, no. Let me just clarify. In the context of a long-term relationship, not only do I think that that, that like me personally, I, I offer that a zero star review. That's a hard no. Would I hang around with you? Yeah, sure. But would I offer you commitment? No. <laughs> would I give you the keys to, the, to, to my house? No. <laughs> There's absolutely fucking no way I'd do that because the, the commitment's not being reciprocated. The dynamic is you offer me all your commitment, I keep my options open. And as soon as you try and shift and go, well, I'll keep some of my options open, ah, there's a problem, it's all off. So my review is absolutely no. But I also wanna add, if you really wanna be in a long-term relationship and you're serious about it, you can't have an intimacy cloud. You can't ask for commitment from somebody without offering it as well. Let me go one step further, as I presume to offer relationship advice. You can't ask for anything in a relationship that you're not offering also. It doesn't work like that. It, it, never, it never really has. I mean, where you have significant differences in hierarchical um, status based on uh, sex, I guess you can. I mean, if you're in a country where you can have four wives or five husbands, there's no such country where you can have five husbands, then, you know, but that's not what we're talking about. They we're talking about like, there's not many countries where that happens anyway, thank God. Um, but if you want equal, you say you want equal, 
You're saying this, but you're not actually doing equal. That's not going to work. Whatever you want from the relationship, you must offer it as well. And you can't. I, I have zero hope, zero hope for people who are steeped in consumer culture, pulling off a long-term relationship. I'm like, it's the most, you need to be an adult. You can't be a selfish, low impulse control having, um, self-indulgent, uh, cons passive consumer and really think that you're gonna pull off a long-term relationship. The new thing that I've heard, the new, uh, and I was appalled when I first heard it, but now, now I see it kind of makes sense. Somebody said to me, somebody very close to me said to me, why don't, why don't you just get into a relationship? And I'm like, because I haven't met a girl who's single who knows how to do a relationship. And he said, don't, don't worry about that. Just get into it, get married, have some kids. And if you get 10 years out of it, you've done all right. And I was like, uh -huh. That's the same thing that somebody would say about buying a car that they're not sure about buying. Yeah, it's good, it's nice looking. Yeah, it's a bit expensive, it's about outside the budget, but it's, I've always wanted one, it's really cool, it looks nice. Ah, if you get, if you get five years out of it, it's not that reliable in the parts, it's an Alfa Romeo. <laughs> the parts are really, really hard to change and it's expensive and it break down, breaks down a lot. Eh, if you get five years out of it, it's okay. I'm like, I, I can't think that way, man. I, I just, I'd rather stay single. I'm not having, I'm not getting into like legally binding contracts and then reproducing and making genetic replications of myself on the basis of, meh, if I get 10 years out of it. <laughs> I said that um, I'm happy being single. Perhaps what I should have said, it was, I wonder if it was a life lie, like in the Adlerian sense, we tell life lies to avoid responsibility because we're not courageous. Perhaps I should have said, I am single and I am happy. Perhaps I shouldn't have said, I'm happy to be single. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's true. I don't know that I haven't just switched off of that part of myself that, that hopes that I could meet another adult who's capable of doing a relationship. And based on what I've seen, I'm like, I just don't want to stop. I just don't hold that much hope for it. But could happen. You never know. So my message for this video, the takeaway for this slightly rambly video. Let yourself be the consumer. Let yourself be the person who leaves the review. For everything. People, relationships, YouTube videos, um, reality. You have the right to say... This sucks and I'm not enjoying it. And I'm speaking now to the codependents uh, more than anybody else. This is an issue for um, fawning style, uh, fawn responders, codependents, is you will struggle to say, I don't like this. I'm not enjoying this. Probably because in childhood you weren't allowed to, but we've all, everybody watching this, every single person watching this has been through the education system. And we were graded from a young age. We were not the graders, we were the graded. We were not the reviewers, we were the reviewed. We were not the consumers, we were the consumed. We were the ones to please, not the ones to be pleased. Think about that and think about how you live your life on that basis. It's good to connect with your authenticity. I really, really love the place I'm at, physically right now, geographically. It's very beautiful. I love this place. Where I'm at emotionally, where I'm at psychologically, I really, really, really love it. But if I wasn't, think of the power of being able to say, I'm not cool with what's going on right now. If I have the capacity to do that, I can make changes. If I don't, I'd never even fucking notice, would I? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for bearing with me through that. I'm telling you, this, uh, it's locked down, it's having an effect on my brain. I am, that was definitely not as sharp as it could have been, but uh, thank you for your patience, your time and your attention, which I do value.
I do not spend it frivolously. I hope that you got value in exchange. Stay grateful for everything that you do have and uh, I look forward to speaking to you again very soon. Cheers. Folks, if you enjoyed that, there are more episodes for you to watch right here. Please click on that. If you want to subscribe to me, do it here. And here is a PDF for you that is completely free.